Welcome everybody to today's uh, nano exploration seminar. I'm Bob Atkins up at Lincoln Lab. It's uh, my pleasure to uh, host today's seminar. I think we have a great talk lined up for you. Um, before we get to that though, a couple of uh, housekeeping things. Uh, those of you who have tuned in before, I think probably familiar with these, but uh, just remind everybody that we are uh, recording the talk. And uh, I encourage everybody to uh, stay muted, I guess, for the talk and, and hold your questions to the end. Uh, we will have a Q&A session at the end. And uh, you can, at that point, uh, send your questions in via chat or uh, you can uh, raise hand or you can, you can simply uh, uh, unmute and uh, ask your question, which I, I think has been working pretty well. Uh, so I think uh, with, with that up front, uh, I'd like to just introduce uh, today's uh, speaker. So uh, today we have uh, uh, Max Olbert, uh, who's a uh, ensign in the US uh, Navy, but also a, a research fellow up at uh, Lincoln Laboratory and uh, a student at Northeastern in uh, the Mechanical Engineering and Material Science Department working with uh, Professor Joshua Galloway. And uh, the, the topic of uh, today is uh, practical fiber batteries for wearables. Uh, many of you may know that uh, with the Internet of Things, uh, there's a desire, of course, to put electronics almost everywhere, but uh, that includes into uh, uh, wearable kind of things. And uh, uh, one of the big challenges, of course, in embedding capability into fiber and fabric um, is the need for energy to uh, support uh, that capability. And uh, Max will talk today about some practical issues and approaches to uh, actually getting batteries into, uh, into, into fiber and fabric. Um, so with that uh, intro, uh, Max, are you all set and uh, ready to present? All good to go. All right, take it away. All right, so hi everyone. So. Uh... Uh, as Bob mentioned, I'm going to be talking about uh, what I've been doing for my uh, thesis work, which is developing a practical fiber battery for wearables based on a zinc manganese dioxide uh, battery chemistry. So a brief little overview. Um, I'm going to be talking about the motivation, which Bob kind of hit, hit on, and then we'll talk about um, kind of battery basics if you're unfamiliar or need some refreshing on basics of electrochemistry, and then the current work I'm doing and the conclusions I draw from it. So to start off, as Bob mentioned, uh, there's a growing research area in um, developing wearable technology, specifically functional fibers. Um, and so with the growing concept of Internet of Things, there's a desire to place uh, smart devices into a variety of different uh, components of daily life. So um, the, the figure on the right is just showing all the variety of different uh, clothing apparel that you can embed these systems into, anything from shirts, pants, hats, watches, et cetera, et cetera, anything you sew. Uh, basically, the the, the uh, there's a desire to embed uh, different devices into, and so um, some of the devices, for example, are are a variety of different sensors. So something like a temperature sensor, a humidity sensor, a chemical sensor, a pressure sensor. Um, there's different energy harvesters to uh, produce the electricity for these systems, such as triboelectric materials, um, thermoelectric materials, photovoltaics, piezoelectric. All these things converting some sort of external energy source into electricity for a usable system. You have memory devices for onboard uh, data collection, as well as RFID, as well as antennas for um, transmission of that data from the fiber. Um, what I see as one of the more uh, applicable economic impact areas is the healthcare system. If you're not aware, the world population is aging and especially in America. And so within a few decades, um, essentially this aging population can easily overwhelm the healthcare system. And so the, the uh, one motivation is to embed these different um, sensors that can measure simple uh, vital signs. And so with that, uh, for example, there's a, a paper published from Fitbit last year that um, just by collecting basic sleeping patterns, so stuff like breathing patterns as well as heart rate while people are sleeping, they can actually detect uh, a variety of different medical conditions such as hypertension, sleep apnea, or even more severe, uh, diabetes. Uh, so basically, uh, fabric-based fabric -based energy systems uh, are a good path towards integrating um, smart concepts into uh, wearable uh, clothing. But with that, there's uh, a major issue in supplying power. So I mentioned um, there are a bunch of different energy harvesters. 
Um, this requires some kind of external energy source. So whether that be a temperature gradient, whether that be solar power, or whether that be the person moving. Um, if someone is sedentary sitting indoor at room temperature, um, there's essentially no electricity production. So you, you need, there's the need for the battery. And the current state of the art um, you can see uh, this diagram right here has a fiber that has a bunch of different components. So anything from just an LED light, photo detector, temperature sensor, pressure sensor. But with this entire fabric, uh, uh, with this entire fiber, um, the current issue is that you need a power brick um, supplied at the end of it. So that power brick could be anything from literally a, a brick sized battery to a alkaline battery such as a double A or uh, something smaller like a coin cell. But to get a fully immersive integrated system, uh, this desire for a fiber battery is necessary. So the current state of fiber battery technology, um, essentially what I'm trying to summarize here is there's a wide approach in the literature. Um, there's different chemistries such as lithium ion batteries, sodium batteries, zinc ion batteries, and then a, a variety of different metal air batteries. So different chemistries, there's different materials for each type of chemistry. Um, and then different structures as well. So the, the, the figure on the left shows um, three of the recurring themes in the different structures in the literature. So parallel, twisted, and coaxial. Um, my, my fire battery that I'm trying to develop, it most correlates with the parallel example. Um, but the key takeaway is there's currently nothing beyond a tech readiness level of four. So everything is still experimental. There's nothing really practical or economic at this point um, due to uh, costly materials, dangerous materials, low power output. Um, and then just an overall, there's none of the works are necessarily worried about the manufacturing process. And so that's something that I'm trying to address in um, my thesis work of eventually uh, moving it towards a very easy, uh, cheap, scalable manufacturing process, which is the thermal draw tower. So if you're unfamiliar with the thermal draw tower, this is specifically a polymer, th uh, polymer draw tower. So essentially, um, this is the, the eventual goal of my project. Uh, so essentially, it's a preform that you are feeding in the battery materials into. So this preform hooks up at the top of the draw tower. For scale, this is about uh, 20, 30 feet tall. Um, and so you place the preform material up here, which is about an inch by half an inch um, and then 12 inches long. And so you, it starts up at the top and then you feed it down into this furnace, which is anywhere from 200 to 300 degrees C. And it's simply a pultrusion uh, uh, process. So you're just pulling the polymer down through the furnace and, and depending on two different speeds, there's the, the feed speed and the draw speed. So how fast you're uh, lowering the preform into the furnace and how fast you're pulling it, uh, you can easily tune the size of this fiber. So overall, the thermal draw tower is the eventual goal um, for a cheap, scalable uh, way to produce um, functional fiber batteries. So now I'm going to go over some of the basics of batteries, if you're unfamiliar. So um, four essential components of batteries, uh, cathode, anode, those are the two electrodes, electrolyte, and separator. So as I'll talk about with solid state electrolytes, um, separators aren't actually necessary as the electrolyte uh, provides a mechanical barrier from the electrodes touching. You don't want the electrodes touching because that'll short the battery and ruin the battery. So um, this diagram on the left is a Daniel cell. It's a rudimentary electrochemical cell um, that uses uh, copper metal bar and a zinc metal bar. Um, there's no separator per se in this example because the beakers are just literally physically split apart. So there's no uh, room for air of the the bars touching each other, but the salt bridge essentially is soaked in electrolyte and acts as the uh, method of ion transportation. So the counterbalance to that charge transfer is the electrons flowing through the load, which is what you are looking for out of a battery is that the electron flow um, to power whatever you're trying to power. Um, and then just for a more modern example and a better picture of what, how batteries operate nowadays, um, on, the on the right diagram, um, this is an alkaline battery cell. Um, as I'll talk about, on the next slide, uh, I'm using a zinc ion battery chemistry. Uh, this actually uses the same materials, manganese dioxide as a cathode and zinc as the anode material. So this is the reason, the, what differentiates an alkaline from a zinc ion battery is essentially the electrolyte used. So it's a very basic electrolyte, it's KOH. Um, and so essentially that allows for byproducts to grow uh, on the zinc anode and uh, the byproducts as well as dendritic growth, which can uh, degrade the battery very rapidly over the course of uh, one cycle. And so an alkaline battery is non-rechargeable as opposed to a zinc ion battery. 
So um, again, the goal of, of my project is to essentially incorporate all of these components of a battery into a fiber. Um, and so as mentioned, I'm going to be using a zinc ion battery chemistry. So uh, what kind of immediately pulled me towards uh, zinc ion chemistry is the inherent safety. So uh, obviously with wearables, uh, they're gonna be sewn into clothing. Uh, we all know clothing has to be kind of rugged. You're gonna be wearing it, you're gonna be throwing it into your hamper. It could go through uh, the washer or the dryer and then any physical, any, any um, uh, daily uh, activity could stretch it and, and you have the, the uh, potential of ripping open the fiber. And so if you uh, recall back to, um, if anyone recalls, there was the, a recall on the Samsung Galaxy Note 7. Um, and this was due to uh, a bunch of different dangerous issues with the battery in the phones. Um, and that was a lithium ion uh, chemistry. So there are, that's not to say that all lithium ion batteries are inherently dangerous, but zinc ion batteries, uh, put, they're, they're non-reactive in air. Um, so there's no flammability issues. There's no toxic materials being used. So in the case that a fiber ever breaks open, um, there's not, not an immediate danger to the wear as, as um, these fibers are literally going to be making direct contact with skin. So that's probably the biggest reason I'm using a zinc ion battery. Um, Secondly, though, uh, it, it's important to note that um, zinc actually has a higher per volume energy density. Uh, so when we're dealing with fiber batteries, which um, are you know on the scale of one to two millimeters um, thick, uh, you want to fit as much energy as possible into the the, the smallest volume possible. Um, and so uh, it's important to note, though, here while zinc has a much higher energy density than lithium. Um, these are typically anode materials, and the anode material isn't necessarily the limiting factor. The limiting factor is typically the cathode. And in my case, I'm using a manganese dioxide cathode, uh, which has a energy density of around 1500 milliamp hours per cubic centimeter. So obviously, uh, the, the manganese dioxide is limiting factor. But it is just important to note that zinc is the kind of um, the ultimate goal if you can match a cathode up to the zinc. Um, so Moving forward for a broader context, um, uh, zinc ion batteries, not necessarily in the fiber form, uh, zinc ion batteries uh, tend to have a lot cheaper of materials. And then in addition, uh, you can see these, these price comparisons, but also uh, lithium cobalt oxide is listed here. Um, and beyond just the expense, uh, there's also geopolitical humanitarian issues, specifically in the mining of cobalt. Um, so, but that's a, a whole nother talk, but essentially it's just to say that zinc ion battery materials are cheap. And then the final point, just that um, there's a wide variety of cathode materials. So just for example, I'm using a manganese dioxide cathode. Uh, there's actually six or seven different crystal structures and they all offer different um, capabilities and capacities. So maybe faster recharging or uh, a higher capacity depending on which crystal structure you're using. So that's just to say there's a lot more to be explored in the zinc ion realm that could potentially um, shift uh, commercialization of lithium ion batteries towards potentially zinc ion uh, battery chemistries. So uh, just for a, a microscopic look at what's going on in a zinc manganese dioxide battery, um, the anode reaction is fairly simple, but what I'd like to draw attention to is the cathode side of things. Um, it's theorized in uh, some of the crystal structures of manganese dioxide uh, that there's co-insertion of zinc and protons. Um, it's not necessarily clear in the literature whether the, this proton insertion is actually going on as uh, the peaks on some um, uh, diffraction patterns are very, uh, MnOOH is uh, fairly similar to the uh, zinc manganese oxide. So overall, um, I can guarantee you that there is uh, zinc insertion going on into the crystal structure of the manganese oxide. So as mentioned, um, to replace, uh, to, to remove the need for a separator, uh, I have to shift to a solid state electrolyte. Um, so specifically for my project, uh, I'm trying to develop a fiber battery with three key characteristics, um, each one pertaining to some aspect of the manufacturing process. So for the first part, uh, it needs to be solid. Um, this is due to the fact that a separator uh, can't process through the draw tower because those materials will either melt or, or produce air bubbles in the, um, eventual fiber, which, cause, which um, uh, poses a lot of resistance to the ionic flow um, between the electrodes. So the, the electrolyte has to be solid, it has to be organic. And so the reason it has to be organic is this essentially, this isn't a hard and fast rule, but this is essentially, um, if you look at, at the, the table on the right, sulfides, oxides, polymers are kind of three broad categories of solid state electrolytes. Um, 
the, the sulfides and oxides not being organic, uh, it means they can't really flow through the draw tower, which is only at temperatures of 200 to 300 degrees C. So the polymer, so the electrolyte has to be organic, i.e. a polymer. Um, and then finally, mild acidity. As mentioned with alkaline batteries, they're very basic uh, electrolytes. And so the mild acidity uh, prevents a lot of dendritic growth as well as prevents some byproducts from forming, which allows the battery to recharge. So these are the three requirements uh, um, that all revolve around the electrolytes. So essentially it all comes down to gel polymers um, are the best uh, bet for developing a, a fiber battery in the method I'm trying to develop it in. And so just for more context, there's kind of three broad categories of polymer electrolytes. Uh, there's solid, gel, and composite polymer electrolytes. Um, these aren't hard and fast rules. Um, so the difference between solid and gel is essentially just the ratio between solvent and polymer. So if it's high in solvent, low in polymer, uh, it could be more of a gel polymer electrolyte, which could be anything from a viscous fluid to something jelly-like. Um, and a solid polymer is something that has a high polymer to solvent ratio. Um, where it's more solid and provides a mechanical uh, uh, mechanical barrier between um, electrodes of a battery touching. And then just the last note, a composite polymer is something that essentially incorporates uh, a variety of different nanoparticles that can help increase the ionic conductivity as solid state electrolytes have a inherently lower ionic conductivity just because of the resistance posed in more rigid um, structures. So now I'm going to move on to uh, what I'm actually working on. So um, there are two papers I'm basing my work on. Um, that is the work on the left, which is the basis of my electrodes, and the basis on, uh, and the paper on the right, which is the electrolyte I'm using. So uh, the paper on the left, um, they use a carbon nanotube fiber that is deposited with manganese dioxide, and then a zinc um, wire, which is simply purchased from Sigma Aldrich. And uh, there is, the issue with this paper for my purposes is they use a water soluble uh, polymer electrolyte. They use uh, PVA, polyvinyl alcohol. And so the issue with the PVA electrolyte is uh, it's, it's a little too fluid. And so they have to actually use a separator to, to prevent the cathodes from touching. Uh, so the separator is soaked in this polymer electrolyte. Um, the challenge with that, as I mentioned, is the separator can't process through the draw tower. So I need a electrolyte that can prevent the electrodes from touching. It needs to be a mechanical barrier from them touching. So this is where I shift gears to a polymer electrolyte developed by Kumar and Sampath, uh, which is a PVDF-based polymer. Um, and the key takeaway here is uh, the chart on the right here. Um, these are these are essentially so cycle number on the bottom capacity on the the y axis and so what this is saying this is showing you is the capacity over uh, a number of, of cycles and the capacity is the measure of energy per gram of the active material in this case manganese dioxide um, so these numbers right here uh, what this means is uh, if you're unfamiliar with C rate uh, basically take the inverse and multiply it by one hour so C over 160 means it, it's a battery cycling for 160 hours. That means 160 hours it takes to discharge the battery. And so that's about one week. So it's discharging very, very slowly at a very low current. Um, and then their highest C rate they use is a C over eight, which resulted in 37 milliamp hours per gram. And so that's kind of the, these figures right here are kind of the numbers I'm, I'm comparing to as uh, the electrolyte is kind of the limiting factor, especially when, when dealing with a uh, solid polymer electrolyte. So as mentioned, um, the only production uh, necessary for the electrodes is the cathode. And so this is done by electrodeposition using uh, chronoamperometric chrono method, which is um, essentially holding the, vo uh, the voltage between uh, a working counter electrode constant. And so you can see it's a three electrode setup with the reference electrode, a working electrode, and a counter electrode. So the working electrode is the CNT fiber, carbon nanotube fiber, um, which is uh, being deposited onto. Uh, and so the challenge with this, of course, is you can see this picture right here. It's very, very, very thin. Uh, so after deposition, I can't, you can't really see anything by eye whether it's working or not. So to verify that I'm actually depositing manganese dioxide uh, onto the CNT fiber, uh, I used, I was able to take SEM images as well as EDS to verify that the materials are there. So, so these pictures here are um, SEM, image, SEM images of the manganese dioxide deposited. 
of course, this isn't necessarily showing that it's definitely manganese dioxide, but it is just showing the texture of the deposited material. The EDS really confirmed that the, the presence of manganese and oxide are present at a, at a two to one ratio oxygen to manganese. So uh, that confirmed uh, that there was a, a layer of manganese dioxide on these uh, CNT fibers. And so then just to further check, um, I, I used a uh, simple electrochemical cell where I put the cathode material into uh, a zinc chloride aqueous electrolyte. So this is obviously a different electrolyte than I'm using for the eventual battery, uh, but this is just a good check to see that um, the battery I'm running is, is doing what I'm expecting. And so the, the, you can see the, the plot on the left is a what's called the voltage plateau of around 1.4 uh, volts. And so this is a good sign as essentially that is about what you would expect between uh, the standard potential of manganese dioxide and, and zinc metal. Uh, so this was just another sign that I'm, I'm getting the results I'm expecting. So the other uh, manufacturing step in, in these fiber batteries is the gel polymer um, electrolyte preparation. So this is a fairly simple process uh, to, to make. Um, it's just a mix of uh, PVDF as the polymer, two solvents, propylene carbonate and ethylene carbonate, and then a zinc triflate salt. Um, so essentially, it takes about an hour of mixing. Um, it, it, it ramps up from 70 degrees C up to 150 degrees C. And so uh, once the polymer is mixed uh, and has a consistent uh, viscosity throughout the whole uh, beaker, um, I do one of two things. I either pour it into a 3D mold, which has a five by five crevice. So that's what this part is right here. This is the eventual polymer electrolyte that will go into uh, the polymer preform for drawing on the draw tower. Um, but for uh, lab uh, for lab experiments that I'm, I've been running, as it will see on the next slide, uh, I actually hand press the polymer with uh, just steel platens. And so I'll show you on the next slide. Uh, it's a, it's difficult to get consistent thicknesses uh, from the electrolyte, which plays a large part in the resistance and further the ionic conductivity. And so uh, a, one of the most important metrics of the uh, any electrolyte, whether that be uh, liquid or solid, is something called electrochemical impedance spectroscopy. So um, EIS produces what's called a Nyquist plot. And so um, there's a lot of different technicalities to it, I would say, but um, the the two most important aspects of a Nyquist plot are the diameter of these semicircles. So you can see this blue is probably the, the best example of a semicircle. And then the distance from the origin to the start of the semicircle. So the, semi, the, the diameter of the semicircle shows you the uh, interfacial resistance between the electrolyte and the electrodes. So essentially the electrode material and the electrolyte has all these tiny little air pores and those little pores um, essentially cause a lot of resistance between those interfaces. And so you can see, obviously, the um, interfacial resistance is very high. But then to counter that, there is the bulk resistance of the electrolyte. So anything in between the interfaces of each electrode, so the bulk material of, of the gel electrolyte is this resistance right here. So this is you know only around you know five, 500 ohms or so, as opposed to um, the interfacial resistance is up to 100 kilo ohms. And then further cycling uh, goes all the way up towards 400 kilo ohms. And so what's interesting on this slide that I'll kind of correlate back to um, when we look at the battery cycling that I'm getting, um, essentially uh, after the first 10 cycles, this, this um, uh, interfacial resistance actually increases and then it rests for another 24 hours and the interfacial resistance uh, greatly increases. And this could be due to just with the battery not cycling, uh, the electrodes are kind of splitting further apart from the electrolyte. Um, but then what's what's interesting about this is after the 24 hour rest cycle, I ran the battery another 10 cycles and the interfacial resistance uh, actually greatly decreased right here. You can see it, it's all the way down to, you know, 10, 10 to 20 kilo ohms. So I will show you um, kind of what what that means um, in terms of the battery performance. So first, the fully formed fiber battery using the cathode I produced and the polymer electrolyte. So this is a fairly simple setup. It's a glass slide, and then I place the zinc wire down, um, and then I place the electrolyte over that, and then just the cathode. Um, it's arbitrary whether the anode or cathode is on top, so that doesn't really matter. Um, 
And then uh, an important note is not, not seen on this picture. Uh, once, once the batteries form, I put another glass slide down and then I, I have to put paper clips down. And so that's to ensure that there's proper contact between the uh, electrodes and the polymer electrolyte. Um, so as mentioned, um, I've been pressing these by hand. And so that, that causes um, a lot of variety in the uh, thickness that I've, I've been achieving with um, the uh, tabletop exercises. And so it varies anywhere from 400 to 800 micron thick. And so that doesn't, that's not going to affect the interfacial resistance, but that is going to potentially double the um, bulk resistance of the electrolyte. So that's where the draw tower will eventually really come in, in handy is you can um, very finely tune exactly how thick you want that electrolyte to be. Um, but overall, these are easy to perform uh, electrochemical tests for uh, the lab purposes without the draw tower. So moving on to how my back batteries are actually performing. So if you're familiar with batteries, um, the chart on the right is, is not exactly what you'd expect out of a, a, a normal battery. A normal battery is typically going to um, be a linear line that slowly fades over time as, as you cycle it more and more. Um, so that, so this, this y-axis again is the specific capacity of the manganese dioxide. And so what is um, a little strange out of these experiments is the capacity is actually increasing through the first you know, 125 cycles, rapidly increasing and then rapidly decreasing. Um, so what, what I would say is the important takeaway here is this is actually fairly competitive and it's, or similar to the work by Kumar. So their battery, again, their, their fastest C rate was a C over eight rate. Um, this battery is actually cycling at a two C rate. So that means um, the C over eight means it's, it's discharging over the course of eight hours. This is discharging over the course of 30 minutes. So even at these very high C rates, eventually, it does surpass this 37 milliamp hour per gram, which is the number uh, Kumar got. Um, so that's a good sign that eventually I am getting the specific capacity they got. Um, the other good takeaway from, from these uh, cycles is we're getting very consistent um, uh, uh, discharge curves. So essentially, uh, this is just to say each, each cycle is fairly consistent, uh, hovering around a nominal voltage of 1.2 volts. Um, but then uh, what I would say is kind of the further uh, takeaway um, and, and a good sign of what's going on and, and points us into what the issue is and, and why we're seeing this increase is uh, after I ran that, that, that battery at 2C for about 200 cycles, uh, actually I greatly lowered the C rate. I lowered the current uh, from a 2C rate to a C over 10 rate. And so you can see this Y axis here on, this last, on the last slide, I was getting a max capacity of around 90 milliamp hours per gram. Uh, you can see here, though, we're getting up towards, at the most, you know, almost 225 milliamp hours per gram, um, but, you know, hovering around 150 to 175. And so what, what I believe is happening here is actually uh, the electrode getting properly wetted by the electrolyte. So what this means is over the course of all these cycles, uh, the, the electrolyte is kind of per, um, protruding into all the pores of the electrode. Uh, so with that proper contact, uh, you know, over time, there's more contact between the electrolyte and the electrode. And so more and more active material, there's more and more material being actively used in the battery discharge cycle. So uh, overall, I believe this is a, a, a good sign that all that really is needed is probably just some more heat. Um, so once once I place those, those glass slides together, what I really should be doing is probably heating up the polymer uh, to really try to wet the rest of the electrodes. Um, because eventually you can see uh, there's probably proper contact going on and that's greatly improving the performance of the battery. Uh, so to finish up, um, overall, uh, the, the battery I developed, there's, there's some, issues to be resolved, uh, but I'm getting the results uh, that are comparable to previous uh, works. And so obviously, as I mentioned, uh, there needs to be more initial wetting of the electrode. So making sure there's better contact between the electrolyte and the electrode. Um, the second bullet is essentially that uh, this, this PVDF material is something uh, that Lincoln Lab has, has worked on um, in drawing through the, the thermal draw tower. And so the gel polymer electrolyte that I'm using should easily transition towards the draw tower, which uh, may or not may or may not be occurring over the next couple of weeks. 
uh, and trying to incorporate the polymer electrolyte just to see how it flows through the furnace. Um, and then just some uh, further work that uh, I believe is needed for practical application. Um, as mentioned, the specific uh, rheological tuning. So essentially, um, you need to make sure that the, the gel polymer electrolyte is flowing at a consistent rate with the COC preform. Otherwise, there could be clumping, there could be air bubbles that produce. Um, there's a bunch of different issues that 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 will need to be worked out. Um, the second note, this is this is second and third note are all about um, optimizing and saving costs. Um, CNT fibers are not necessarily a cheap material, uh, so it's it's worthwhile looking into trying to find a replacement for the CNT fiber, which acts as the current collector. So that's that's the um, object carrying the electrons to to your external load. And then this last point again, cost saving is all about active material uh, optimization. So essentially, I, I talked about how uh, zinc has a capacity three times larger than the manganese dioxide. So it's important um, to note that the zinc wire that I'm using is 125 micron thick. The manganese dioxide uh, deposited on the carbon nanotube fiber is only about 25 micron thick. So um, essentially, I'm just wasting a lot of zinc capacity. Uh, so for further work, um, there's a need to kind of optimize the active material. Uh, and so with that, uh, whoop, sorry. Uh, with that, I'd just like to thank uh, pretty much everyone at Group 81 up at Lincoln Lab. Uh, very helpful in teaching me a whole lot about um, fiber systems. And then, of course, my thesis advisor, as well as his postdoc, Josh, Dr. Josh Galloway and Dr. Andrew Brock, for uh, teaching me a lot about um, batteries and how to make them and how to perform a bunch of different tests. So with that, uh, I guess we're open for questions or Bob. Yeah, uh, Max, thanks. That was a great brief. And uh, I guess uh, we'll start by opening things up for questions. And I think uh, you know, as we've done successfully in the past, if people have questions, just uh, unmute and uh, go ahead and ask them. Maybe I'll start off. So uh, uh, you talked a little bit about next steps. Uh, you know, uh, can you talk maybe a little bit about how far we are from, you know, like a commercial realization here? What are what are some of the other steps beyond what you talked about? Uh, so. Yeah, uh, I, I really do think uh, this this is a potential route forward. Uh, again, I, I would say honestly to towards um, maybe not necessarily commercial applications, but for more niche applications where you can spend a little bit more money um, per battery, essentially, uh, just replacing the CNT fiber um, should really drive down the cost and allow for um, a battery to develop fairly soon. Um, there's of course. Lincoln is working on a separate path, but I think this is definitely, um, there, there really shouldn't be many issues in, in developing this. So long story short, I would say within a couple of years, this is really uh, feasible, at least in niche DOD applications, but uh, economical applications, probably several years down the road, at least. If that. Okay. Question. Hey, uh, uh, we do have uh, at least one question in the in the chat. So uh, um, Vladimir Bolovic asks, uh, uh, "What's the weight of you know fabric made from such fibers? Um, I guess how does how does the weight of the fiber here compare to other fibers that maybe have less dense materials? Or I guess that's really the question: is the density?" Uh, so uh, fibers in general, uh, fiber systems in general, I can't exactly speak on. Um, but for a fiber battery, uh, for some of these micro devices, I would say the the lengths that we're talking about. So for a bigger picture, in, in a shirt, um, it's it's estimated that there's about two kilometers worth of fiber sewn into it. So. Uh, I'm definitely walking around exactly. I, I've, I don't exactly have the number of the exact weight, but what I'm trying to get at is there's two kilometers of fiber, and what you're trying to do is replace anywhere from one to 50 meters of, of that uh, fabric with uh, smart fiber devices. And with the battery, it could be anywhere from, you know, of that 50 meters, it could be, you know, 10, 20% of that length. So overall, I would just say, uh, it really wouldn't be entirely too noticeable in a lot of different applications. Okay, so we're not trying to turn my entire shirt into a battery. 
No, uh, no, that would be, no, that would be a lot. <laughs> okay. Um, I guess another question, uh, how are the batteries supposed to be recharged? You know, what happens after damage of the fabric? Uh, isn't it simpler to run a wire from the brick battery to the device? So, uh, yeah, in terms of rechargeability, uh, Lincoln's working on a couple of different things that uh, I don't know if what exactly I could talk about. So I'm gonna kind of avoid that topic. Um, there, there, I mean, I could think of a, a couple of different ways where you could just kind of cap the end of the battery with some kind of uh, plastic cover uh, that you could remove. And so it would be, it definitely wouldn't be your typical uh, USB-C port or, you know, iPhone Thunder port or, or whatever um, Apple uses, but uh, you'd probably have to hook it up with wires. So again, more niche applications where you're um, okay not having a, a commercially available uh, charger. Uh, what happened to the damage to the fabric? Uh, so honestly, that's something I guess I haven't uh, thought about too much in terms of dealing with uh, any kind of electronic waste from it. Um, whether, you know, if the shirt's still good and the battery's bad, then uh, I guess that's something I haven't uh, considered a whole lot. Uh, so I guess that that would um, I will look into that. Um, but simpler to run a wire. So the the external uh, energy source, which is currently kind of the state, and so uh, for a lot of different applications, uh, integrating the fiber battery into the shirt is is not detrimental to the overall system. Um, but I would just say, um, at least on the DoD side of things, there are there are applications that really require um, direct integration into the fiber systems. Um, but even for commercially available, you know, you could imagine if you're wearing a shirt, you don't necessarily want it to be hooked up to a battery in your pocket. Say you're wearing, you know, pocketless short uh, shorts or something. Um, so I would just say, it's 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 in general, it's just a very novel approach, and it's probably the most extreme um, best case scenario is is really what it is. But again, a brick battery can be um, won't be detrimental to the fabric system in general. Are there, uh, I guess, along the damage to the fiber of fabric, are there are there uh, um, concerns like you know you, you do have to worry with some batteries more than others. I'm not sure about this chemistry, but you know. If I, uh, you know, cut that in half or you know pound on it, and you know, can I get a thermal response that could, you know, ignite it um, or otherwise cause a problem that I'd be worried oh. about if I can't? <laughs> yeah, no. So um, <laughs> uh, really, the uh, you just the, the most you could do is if you you know if you cut it open and you start rubbing your eyes and eating it, uh, that probably wouldn't be great for you but um, in terms of flammability there's there's no um, there's no risk really of it of it catching fire and you could see um, you know I, I talked about um, uh, inherent safety these batteries are exposed to the air the entire time um, they're they're really pretty rugged in terms of um, there's no safety risk um, other than like I said if it does if you are exposed to it and you know the electrolyte starts making contact um, slash the carbon nanotube fibers if any of those uh, carbon nanotubes kind of rub off on your skin you definitely want to wash that off but um, I would say just much steps beyond um, a lithium metal is to be exposed to your skin okay I guess uh, one more question in the chat can you elaborate further on how the battery or the gel polymer electrolyte could be commercialized for use in a draw tower? So, um, so essentially, uh, with the draw tower, so you have a 12 inch preform. And so that, so essentially what you're doing is you're, you're, um, you're starting with a 12 inch preform and by drawing that down you're getting potentially meters and meters and meters of fiber and so what lincoln lab um the dfdc defense fabric discovery center um they were actually working on even uh, lengthening those fibers so um in general uh you can have one continuously produced uh fiber uh, from, you know, say maybe a three foot long uh, preform and you're getting hundreds of meters and potentially kilometers of meter, uh, sorry, kilometers of fiber. Um, and so what's definitely, that's obviously a continuous process, but 
what is batch is the electrodeposition of the carbon nanotube fiber. So there are there are commercial uh, there are commercial electrodeposition methods. Uh, that continuously deposit materials as they run through a series of different like electrolyte baths, essentially. Um, so that would definitely take um, a, a large upfront cost. But the zinc wire is fairly simple because um, let me uh, scroll down to the draw tower again. Um, essentially up at the top, you just have two rolls of wire feeding in. So you would have the uh, cathode material, which again is produced in a batch process currently, but there are commercial processes to uh, continuously electro deposit material onto whatever you're trying to deposit onto. And then there would be a second reel of ink wire, which again, you could just simply purchase from any a variety of different companies. And so these wires are, are feeding into the preform as it's being drawn down. Um, and so, I hope that answered your question. It's it's fairly easy to um, scale up very quickly by using polymer preforms. All right. Well, uh, that that brings us to a uh, quarter of. So uh, I, I think maybe we'll we'll stop there. I think that there might be a couple more questions in the in the chat, but I encourage folks to follow up with Max um, directly on those. Um, hey, Max, uh, I guess everybody, uh, maybe we could give Max a, a virtual round of applause. Uh, good talk. Uh, thanks very much for, uh, for presenting. Uh, and, uh, and good luck in, in uh, finishing up your, your studies uh, this spring and, and uh, what you're off to next. Um, so that, uh, that brings us to the end. I guess I'll just mention before we leave, uh, plug for the next uh, nano exploration seminar coming up. Uh, in April, on the 13th of April, uh, Ty Christoph Tempesta uh, will be giving a talk on uh, small molecule assemblies with a bulletproof design, the Armid uh, Amphiphile. Uh, so uh, hopefully everybody will, will tune in again for, uh, for that talk. Um, until then, uh, thanks everybody for joining and uh, take care. <laughs>